evening, Booktopians. My name is Nick Wasilia, and I come to you from Sydney, from the lands of the Camaragal people as part of the Euro Nation. And I pay my respects to all Indigenous Elders, past, present and emerging. Tonight, we have two very special guests joining me for a discussion about the doors of outdoor adventure, about the joys, rather, of, uh, of outdoor adventuring and two incredible books that they have written. My first guest uh, joins us all the way from the UK, so a very good morning to Alastair Humphreys. He's an adventurer, blogger, and a winner of the National Book of Adventure of the Year in 2012. He's also the author of Arts and Adventure, which came out in August this year. Alastair, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. And my second guest is Bo Miles. He's an award-winning filmmaker, polyjobist, YouTuber, still a new dad, and a self-described oddball, which I absolutely love. And he's the author of The Backyard Adventure of Bo. Welcome. G'day, mate. Yes, as with Al. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you both. And I'm really looking forward to talking about these books with you guys. So for everyone in the audience uh, who is there, welcome to you guys as well. Good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are in the world. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to pose to Bo or Alistair, don't keep them to yourselves. Uh, throw it in the comments section and we'll get to them at the end of this live event. But before we dive into, the, into these books and into what you guys have been up to, um, I kind of want to ask how, you, how you've been, because these books are coming out in a, in a very interesting time uh, uh, in, in the context of the world right now. Um, I'm based here in Sydney. We've just come out of lockdown. I know Paul Bo is in Victoria. Um, and is still very much in a lockdown. Um, how have you guys been in terms of lockdowns first? I'll throw to you, Alistair, because we haven't been hearing a lot of what's going on in the UK. How have you been? Uh, well, the UK seems to be doing a pretty good job of uh, self-destruction over recent years. Um, <laughs> and lockdown's been joyful for everyone. Um, my take on how I've been has been that I hated every single minute of everything to do with lockdown. It's driven me nuts. But... I remind myself consciously every day that I've had it better than 99% of the world. So I've been trying to make the most of getting out and seeing what little I can with the constraints that are on us all. But yeah, I think we're all ready for some adventures. And if ever there was a time to learn about how to have backyard adventures from Bo, this is definitely it. So it's very timely. Absolutely. It couldn't have come at a, at a better time. I couldn't. Have, it, um, Bo, I know that you kind of been uh, you're in Victoria which is now holding the dubious title of probably the most lockdown place in the world how are you uh, how are you feeling at the moment well I've got to be careful with who I uh, talk to about this because um, <laughs> gee uh, I'm out here on the farm and I'm close to a whole bunch of forest and I know a lot of the farmers around me and a lot of the, the folks around me and um, it, when I get lost in the forest, which happens a lot, actually, um, for someone who knows how to use a compass, I get lost a lot. And that means I tend to go a fair way or, or for a fair chunk of time. Uh, so it's been blissful, I, I must admit. But I know that I'm very lucky to, to be able to say that. We're on five acres here. I've got my two-year-old daughter and my wife, my two best mates, uh, in lockdown on a little piece of Eden. It's um, It's been terrific. <laughs> but... Uh, I do know too, I, I am missing my mates and I'm missing maybe going um, to further afield. Uh, but you know what? Uh, it is what it is. And, and it's, um, I'd rather a life of turmoil for its interest value than something that was beige. And it's certainly not that at the moment. So it brings about its challenges, but I kind of like that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been a unique experience that we've all been dealing with over these you know, last you know, 18 months or two years or so. Um, one of the things that I kind of want to ask you guys about is adventures that you can actually do in your backyard. So for people who are in lockdown, there is no limits to what you can actually do when you're actually in your backyard. Um, and there's actually things that, that you know, are potentially open there to you. Um, Alistair, do you have any recommendations for any of our listeners uh, of, of fun adventures that you can do when you are in lockdown? Yeah, I, mean, I in many ways, I think my last 20 years has been training for lockdown and that I spent quite a few years like Bo chasing big macho expeditions around the world, trying to do big, tough, difficult stuff as far away from my backyard as I possibly could get. And the, the distance from my backyard was one of the key 
factors in how good an expedition was. And I moved from those big trips down to increasingly small, 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 little local micro adventures, trying to seek um, the same sort of enjoyment and lessons and learning and curiosity and fun um, that I used to get on the big stuff really, really close to home. And um, I've been practicing those ideas for years. And so in that sense, lockdown has been the, the ultimate test of that to suddenly not be able to go far. And can I still live adventurously as a sort of energetic, restless, hyperactive person close to home? So I've been, um, um, well, I've been climbing a tree every month um, for the last three years now. And that has been, I think a good thing to do with adventures, try and be more childlike, not childish, but childlike. And climbing a tree is the sort of thing that kids enjoy and therefore adults should do it more. It's good exercise. It's um, it's fun, which we really need a little bit of at the moment. And it's a wonderful way to get away from the news cycle out into nature and the universe and whatever tree you climb anywhere on the planet, some rubbish little tree in your backyard, you are right there out in nature watching the universe and the seasons change. So that's been brilliant. I've also been trying to run every single street around where I live. Um, unlike Bo, I don't live on a farm in Eden. I live in a boring little suburb just outside London in rainy old England, uh, but still running every single street, every little back alley, the dead ends, the cul-de-sacs, uh, through the housing estates, the factories, and I've amazed myself how many places just a couple of miles from home I've never seen before in my life. And if you go somewhere you've never been in your life, then you're exploring as much as if you go off to the North Pole, I guess. So that's a couple of examples of what I've been up to. And then the, the main projects I've been doing in lockdown, I've got my the local map of where I live um, when we were allowed to just go out for an hour at a time. And I'd make an effort to go out and I'd explore one grid square of a map so that's one kilometer square and i go to that and i try and walk every single footpath on it every single little bit in it and really pay attention really notice what was out there take photographs just try and learn 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 and i have discovered so much on this one single map that i live on um i wasn't sure whether one map would just be really boring and limiting but it has blown my mind and actually i'm wondering whether i could just spend my entire life exploring this one small little map now so that's what i've been up to in lockdown i love it <laughs> it definitely gives us some new context to you know when you're limited and you're stuck in that space you need to be able to find a way to to make use of it it's definitely been an experience for many here in Sydney, for example, when you're isolated in the five kilometer region that you can't leave, you explore every single nook and cranny that uh, of that region, you just, and you discover places that you you might not have before. I love the fact that you're still climbing trees. I think that's fantastic. It makes me uh, my go out and climb a tree, which is amazing. Bo, you have a different experience because you're out in in country Victoria. Have you uh, been able to to get out and explore your local area a bit more? What's the experience, uh, kind of backyard experience, been like for you? Uh, well, I've I've lived here my whole life, and so that brings with it a few things. First of all, you think you know your area because I've I've spent my entire life here, or at least coming home to this area. So I was here solidly for the first twenty odd years, and then lots of share houses, and then an awful lot of travel. So I've still probably spent thirty of my forty years on Earth in Australia and the other 10 were off traveling or in the U S uh, so you think, you know, your area uh, until one, you get a, the, you, you reach a phase of your life when you're a father and where you don't want to go away as much anymore and, and guiding the same patch of river or the same sea coast uh, or same mountain ranges just doesn't have the, the zing it used to. And yes, when you become a guide, it very much, it, particularly when you repeat trips, it becomes very much about who you're with. Um, but that starts to, to wear off after a while. And you think, gee, I just don't want to go away as much anymore. But like Alistair, and, and look, he, you turned micro adventure really, didn't you, Alistair? And you really turned this, how can I find Everest within my own sphere of, of ability or time or money? Um, they're really wonderful challenges to take on because the power of perception is, is epic and why not? Uh, let's fool ourselves into thinking that a river down the road is Everest because you can, you can, you can think that and why not? You know, it saves you a bunch of money and it's a whole lot less risky and you can home for dinner. It's, that's great. Um, 
So, so to, to flip on that. So, okay. I think I know my area until you actually start to really look into your area. Um, and I realized that I was a real transient young bloke who thought I knew where I lived and I just, I just don't or didn't. And so, um, like Alistair, I, I haven't got the one grid thing, but much the same sort of, uh, idea in that, um, there's some intimacies around here that, are sick and healthy and, um, uh, powerful for me to go and see or, or, or not. There's some underwhelming places, certainly, but you have to see some underwhelming places to find some nooks and crannies sometimes. And it's been beaut. Not a whole lot has changed in my life since this pandemic hit uh, flat out. It just hasn't. Um, in fact, it's been more productive and um, a lot less moving parts. I've, I've really enjoyed it. I, I quite like it. It's, it's sort of something's come along to make us question the busyness of our lives. And I, I like that. And I know how lucky I am to be able to say that too, as a wealthy Western bloke. Uh, with clean air and five acres around me so yeah life is really good and so but I know it yeah and you've definitely been productive with that time and one of the things that you know you've been doing is, is um I want to talk to you both before we jump into the books uh, themselves um about the writing process and I'm, I know I'm coming at this from two different perspectives but this is you know your first book uh and Alistair this is your 13th um What's the, what has the writing process been like? How do you approach uh, the writing process, whether you differ from, uh, differ from, from time to time? I'll throw to you, Alistair, first. Uh, what is your, what's the writing process been like for you when it comes to putting these books together? Well, although I write books for my life, I hate writing. <laughs> so, for example, this it's uh, nine o'clock in the morning. I'm talking to you now. And my first thought this morning was, oh, yes, I get an excuse to not have to write my book for an hour. I just get to chat uh, to some nice guys online for a bit because I find it really, really hard work. So for me, writing books has to be a discipline to force myself to my desk first thing in the morning. And my rule is I have to write a thousand words. That's my challenge. Do a thousand words and the rest of the day is a bonus. So I find it a real struggle to do. But I find that once I've actually written the 100,000 really rubbish words, I really then enjoy the process of polishing, editing, cutting, trying to trim things down to get my message across. So I, I really like the later stages of book writing, but I don't really like the actual writing part. Yeah, it's 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 often like you you you're the first the, the editing is often when it really comes together because it feels you're, you're actually you've got the clay you've got the actual uh, you've got the actual bones right and you need to mould it something else which is which has such a positive it, it, you can see it come together. Bo, was the experience similar for you? Uh, this being you know that your first kind of real foray into into publishing a book. Uh, yeah, look, I um. I enjoyed it. I must admit, I, I do enjoy writing, but I only enjoy it because I don't do it as much as Alistair. I think it's it's more of a, a hobby for me, I suppose. And I look, I've written a PhD before, and that was a six year process, and then that probably blew out to a thousand odd pages that had to be whittled back to three or four hundred. So that was a huge expansion that came down to a more of an essence, which is much like a book. But um, the backyard adventure wasn't that. It, it was very much. Um, it was probably finding my own voice again. I was pretty boring. I, I'd been in academia for a bunch of years, which which takes the eye out of, even though I'd, I'd tried to exploit um, a sort of bowish way of talking and thinking and, and putting that through sort of a, a theoretical lens and methodologies and all these things that were, that were quite convoluted and, and often contradictory to the way I'd, I just want to be outside getting my hands dirty and going for a run in the woods in, in an old t-shirt. Uh, it, they're so, they're so polar opposites to the clean and neat, uh, idea of, of making polished words, um, in front of a computer screen. They just, they weren't really me. Um, but to answer your question, I, I enjoy writing. I think, um, I always have, uh, but not to the point where I, I'm, I'm really only doing it maybe 50 or a hundred days a year. When I wrote the backyard adventurer, it was far more intense, uh, but that was still, it was still only, I've got a four hour window. I can write for four hours and that's about it. And then I've got ants in my pants. I need to be outside and, and I have a big to-do list anyway. I just want to go and do stuff. Um, I feel like it gives me balance. It gives me my long eyesight back. Um, 
my shoulders can unwind. My biggest injuries in life have been sitting at a computer. So I, I, I'm well aware of that. So I like the process in, in isolation. Yeah. And it's, it definitely is reflected in, you know, that your enjoyment and your love is, is being out there in, in the environment. So let's get into these books. And Bo, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you first about the backyard adventure. Um, I had the pleasure of, of reading this over the weekend. Um, and I love the way that you uh, approach this book. You talking about your experiences, walking, paddling, running, um, and all the, and you also show all the adventures that you did for each one. Um, people know you from YouTube and, uh, and such, and the vibe I got from, from reading this book was just that real sense of enjoyment in the adventuring lifestyle, the pure joy and the, the value in it. Was that the goal for you when you sat down to write this book? It was a real collabor collaboration with Brio, to be honest, because I, at the very start point, I had no idea where this would end up, which, which is always, that's always a cherry for me. I quite like that idea is to chase something. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, and I think that a lot of adventurers um, or a lot of adventurous types uh, think that way. They like the idea of not quite knowing what's happening. Um, but in terms of, uh, I suppose, the, the how I wanted to lay down the stories. So when you go and do something, say you go for a hike for the weekend and it's a, it's a two-night hike and you go with your best mate or your girlfriend or wh whoever you go with. And that, that's a... You know that's a forty-eight hour experience, and within that, you might you might retell a couple of stories that take place in that forty-eight hours. But it still took forty-eight hours to create those stories. Now, when I make a film, they're often one day or right through to five or six months in duration. Like Alistair, you're you're right around the world. How many years was that, mate? That was years, wasn't it? Uh, four years, yeah. Four years around the world. That is epic, right? Now, if he took, did you take a camera with you for that? You took a, you had that on camera, didn't you? Uh, not on video, no. Um, I took, in four years, I took 3,000 photos. I now sometimes take that many on a weekend trip. So, no, I was really unvisual on that trip. Well, he still took a lot of notes, though. And it's still yeah, a, not, a lot of notes. That is still a mass of experience, a huge chunk of experience. And, in fact, it's, you know, it's a, it's a 20th or a 30th of his entire life. It's huge. It's a massive thing. Now he's got to come back home or he's compelled to come back home and to relay those stories in, in some form or another. And whether it is just over a cup of tea with someone or in a book or a film. When I make my films, they're, they're those things that take place out there in their real form over that, that period of time. You make the film and that's a 10 or 12 or 20 minute version of it. Now what the book is doing and what I aim to do, and I made this call pretty early on with the crew at Brio, was to expand on that. What a book allows you to do then is to is to open back up again. You know, you, I've, I've had the essence of the film, which needs to be a short format to keep eyeballs on the screen. And then a, a book form can elaborate. You can, you can expand on some of the things that maybe you didn't tell well or that you missed out or you didn't shoot or you didn't think to shoot or you just didn't do a good job of telling in the first place. So I love the idea that this is a triple pronged approach. You have an experience, you make a film and you rehash it out in book form. And I, I loved it. I think it's beaut. And I think I've found a formula. I think my next, my next book will more than likely be based on the next 15 films I make. That's awesome. And I think it's also the, the fact is that you're not, you don't just cover the pure uh, adventuring experience. There's, there's a real, this book has such a solid heart to it. Um, you also cover the, the adventure of being a dad. Um, you talk about your times um, when you were doing, uh, you mentioned you were doing a PhD and how you spent years putting that all together. Um, what, what was it like actually putting it down on the page? Did, did it put con like uh, those moments in your life uh, into context in ways that you hadn't seen before? Yeah, being a dad, is that, that what you're essentially asking the dadhood thing on how that affects uh, a, an adventurous life? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, what it does. Uh, look, Nick, w without getting, I think my, many parents have this sob story or this bore story of uh, my life changed immediately as soon as I became a parent, uh, which is sort of, I don't know, you can take it or leave it. Uh, yes, it did. Of course it did. Um, my, my heartbeat hasn't. You know, I'm still very much bow in, in my missions and my ambitions. And I, you know, and they're, 
they're they're pretty complex, uh, and they haven't changed in their complexity. They've just been added to. But what May has done categorically, she has she has changed my ego uh, in that you you kind of your your identity is built upon many years of transactions and feedback loops with other people, fundamentally people, and when this one human comes along, she becomes so important that you lose. Uh, or at least I did, I lost my want almost immediately to want to engage with those feedback loops more. In many respects, it solidified Bo more um, because I, I now have a mission now to to create a, a great human in the world or to help uh, and to be a great dad. And so it took the emphasis off me. It was quite liberating. So it has changed the way I think fundamentally in many, many ways. And yet what it is, it's just changing the transect of where Bo now goes. I've got these sort of slightly divergent lines from the from the day she came along, and so uh, it's excellent. It, it's, it was a real bolt to to change the way I think, but to sort of change the way it already is. Yeah, I suppose in those set of circumstances as well. That uh, would it make you look on those like whenever you're out, you know. You're out sleeping in a in a riverbed somewhere. Does it make you uh, look and appreciate those experiences even more? Because you're already someone that loves that that outdoor space. It screams off the page in this book. Um, did, does it make you even more appreciative of, of of that feeling and that connection? No, I, th- I think what it does is it makes me um, question being there. Uh, if I'm in that river without May or without Helen or without another great friend. Uh, it, it solidifies the importance of shared experiences, which is, um, which is somewhat uh, a challenge to me because I love my alone time. I, I, or I, ha- I love it. I run because I, I love being alone as much as I love the feeling of fitness and strength. Uh, it's much the same with solo paddling for most of my life. Um, and so, yeah, so if I'm now sitting in a riverbed and and I'm thinking this is wonderful and I'm sitting sipping a cup of coffee and and listening to kookaburras, I think gee, wouldn't May love this or wouldn't Helen love to experience this with me? So, yeah, uh, it's it's change. You know, it just adds another layer and it's it's great. It's good to have that layer. Yeah, and I can imagine in the next book we'll uh, we hope that they'll come along and you can have a you can have a group adventure. <laughs> Too right. Yeah. What, what was uh, what was the most enjoyable part of, of putting this book together, out of curiosity? Was there a particular part, for example, where you were talking about all of your adventures or everything? Um, were there particular things that you were like, yes, this is, I'm absolutely loving writing about this particular thing? Uh, I liked, um, there's only really one, cha- I mean, I liked all of it. A lot of it was a recap and a how to, so, so most of the chapters are based on films or film ideas or things that are already out there in the ether that have had this essence shown about them. Or if I've done my job right, a film should be a, a, the penultimate essence of the experience to portray to others the, the feeling of what took place. Um, now, to expand on that in book form, it was, it was, um, it was kind of fun, but, but it was, uh, the job was done in a sense. I just had to cobble the words together somehow. Whereas the one I made up, I, I made up um, the whole introductory sequence to um, chapter five, where I it, it's an, a full introduction to why I give a damn about food experiments or food. And we all give a damn about food, but because it's such a commonplace thing, we often don't give it the, I suppose, the experimental value that it's worth beyond diets and things, you know, and we all, we all play with our diets and it's such a huge part of our day to day and our culture. Um, but to really play with it, and I mean not just in that diet form, but to to question to question the very essence of life uh, via food. Um, I really loved writing that introduction because it, it was very imaginative and um, very uncomplex in a sense. And I was able to tell stories that I've been meaning to tell for a while, like road tripping across the US with friends in those really formative years. I loved it. It was it was a real treat to write. Bo, can I ask you a question? Of course you can, Alistair. I've been dying to talk to you as well. (laughs) Sorry, Nick, I'm going to put you out of a job. You have a cup of tea. I'll I'll, I'll take it from here. Uh, Bo, what I want to ask you about is the the essence of truth in 
storytelling. So I think you can, um, when I try and make films, I'm often juggle all sorts of stuff around in order to try and make it the the essence of it more true than if it was just purely chronological. Um, I, I'm, I hope you understand what I mean by that. But what the question then is, when you then come to write a book about the experiences, did you end up at times veering towards a, a different but equally valid truth? And the reason I ask that is because I made a, a film about uh, busking, playing my violin very badly through Spain uh, on YouTube. And it's one kind of film. It's quite a jolly, cheerful, have an adventure sort of film. And then I wrote the book of that story and that veered off into a totally different very much more introspective thing so did you feel your truths diverge at all in the books or did they just cement and focus more no they very much diverge and that's a good question in the sense that um i mean i wrote a whole chapter on that in my phd on the on the representation of truth and what is truth and and how we uh you know how we're we're so often tied to chronology in, in many primary schools teach kids to to write stories from once upon a time to happily ever after. And they write in this very lineal way with time and days and meals, uh, whatever it might be. And the tar characters like Tarantino often throw this on its head and start you at the beginning or start you at the end rather. And then you're, you're all over the place with chronology, but, but humans have a remarkable sense to be able to pick up when things took place and, and how it took place. And, I absolutely now, I think, write the way I make films, which is 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 in many respects non chronological order. And whilst sometimes they come across as just very chronological things, there've been reshoots in there, and I've had different ideas. And if I was to go back and make remake any of my films now, they'd be very different because I've evolved my sense of knowledge, truth, and my um, representation of what actually took place. Or more importantly, what's worth saying or what I think is worth saying that someone might give a damn about. And that's, um, it's fantastic that we evolve like that. It's, it's great. And yeah, so truth, and, it mate, it goes off. I don't know what the wedge of difference would be, but I'm, I'm on a three to 5% and it's just, it just continues. <laughs> did you, did you find it quite liberating in some sense, the writing? Cause I find when you film stuff, the, the footage you've got, that is all you have got for your film. And if you missed something out, that's really annoying when you come to edit later. But with a book, then it's it's in many ways much easier than that. Well, uh, well, yes and no. So what what I have on under here, um, Alistair, and I won't take off many many more layers. But I've I've got on um, what I considered seventeen seventy apparel. <laughs> so this morning, I'm about to release a film. It's about three weeks away from being released, and the opening is the, the introduction to the film is crap. It's just, it doesn't. Well, it's okay. It's but it's okay, and I I wouldn't continue watching myself. So I thought, right, how do I reinvent this? So I took a boat and the crew down today to a, a piece of coast with a river outlet, and reenacted Cook landing in Australia. And it, because I didn't have the footage, it wasn't shot six months ago. So I went to recreate this thing, and so. We do that a lot now. We recreate things that were left behind um, creatively off the wall. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but I, yeah, so I'm in many respects trying to do what I do in films with text and what I do with text with film. Uh, I think they're really complementary because they're such different mediums. Thank you. Yeah, yeah there's, there is a lot of a, there is a, you know, a creative overlap, which I get so enjoyable. And it's, it's it's a reflection that so many people who have been picking up this book have been viewing your it as a perfect extension of the work that you do on YouTube, and it's, uh, it's fantastic to see that. Um, I want to move on now to to Alistair's book, uh, Ask an Adventurer. Um, Alistair, you know, people are very well versed with who you are, um, and I really love this book uh, because it got like just such a fantastically practical examination of the lifestyle that that you lead going on adventures and such. And you mentioned early on in the book, which is something that really stuck with me very well um, for pretty much the entirety was the definition and the idea of, of a working adventurer. Um, can you elaborate further on this for, for our, uh, our listeners? Because it's such a great quote and I, and such a great definition of, of what you do. 
Okay. Yeah. So I call myself a, a working adventurer and I stole this idea, like all good ideas, uh, from I was listening to an interview on the radio years ago when there's an artist being interviewed on the radio and she described herself as a working adventurer. And what she meant by that was she was earning her living from making art. She enjoyed doing art. She was earning her living from it. And what more could you want from that? And I found that a really helpful concept because I think until then I thought if you're an artist you have to be Picasso or Van Gogh or else you're just a, a charlatan claiming to be something and you're not uh, or in my world of trying to be an adventurer and explore I wanted to be you know, Ranulph Fiennes or uh, Bo Miles or one of these superstar rugged hero explorers and what I realized with the notion of a working adventurer was that as long as I was doing adventures that I loved and that felt meaningful and important to me. And I was also able to pay the bills somehow through those adventures. And sheesh, I was the luckiest man in town. And that was perfectly enough for what I wanted in life. And I hope that's a useful phrase if you're a, I don't know, a, a graphic designer or a carpenter or something. If you're making your living out of something creative that you enjoy, then that's a success, really. So throughout the book, I try and base it all on Here's my experiences as a working adventurer. It's not the right way to do things. It's not necessarily the best, but it's kind of what works for me. Yeah, um, but I love that you kind of put it put it out in such a way that people can, uh, can really digest the practicality of it. And I'm assuming that this has probably come from a place of you have a lot of people coming up to you and saying, um, this lifestyle, this chance to get in touch with nature again, this chance to go on adventures, whatever, however they, whether it be a massive trek across um, across the Americas or just a small micro adventure. Um, I want to know, I want to be able to do that. It was, did, did this book kind of come from a place of just wanting to say to people, this is how to, this is my own personal experiences of how, I got, of how I got to where I got. Yeah, so this book was my um, lockdown book. Um, the the world got locked down i couldn't go off and do an adventure and write about it in the way that i usually would so i was kind of stuck at home and so i said on twitter um something like how can i be useful to you guys with the the knowledge that i have um how i'm a working adventurer uh, how could i what questions might I have if you're a, a in an unconventional career or you're a self employed creative what do you want to know? And I'll try and answer it. And I got all these questions coming in on social media. And I would take one question each week, go for a two or three hour bike ride within the restrictions. Uh, think about that, come home, write it up as a chapter. So it's just a, a book full of questions that people ask me about life as an adventurer or making a living as someone who does sort of creative type stuff. Well, it's pretty particular... niche. Yeah, it is. It is very niche. And was there, was there any particular questions that it surprised you as you were coming to see? Because there are a lot of questions in this book, and you 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 give it the full works in terms of uh, being you know very detailed in how you respond. You take a lot of care with them. Were there any kind of questions that even surprised you um, as you were putting this book together? Um, no, not really, because the, I realised that I get asked the same questions over and over again. And um, what I've tried to do for years, actually, in, in blogging, I spent years blogging back when the word blogging existed. And what I used to do then was when people would email me questions, rather than just reply, taking an hour replying to that one guy, I would write it as a blog post and stick it up there and try and answer that question for them. So, no, I wasn't really surprised by them. It was the stuff I get asked all the time about how do you make time for adventure how do you get the money for adventure how do you do adventures if you don't have much money uh, and then more specific to me how do you make a living out of adventure and how to get your books published but they're also it's quite nice there are also a few questions and i think this reflects this sort of changing mood within the outdoors world of how can you justify adventure and flying and a bit more questions about the sort of ethics and morals of the outdoor community as well which is nice to see yeah, it's nice to see. It was so great to see how the kind of how your audience engaged with this book um, and how it came together. Because you you elaborate quite honestly on the challenges around money, around time, around uh, social media, etc. What's the one? Have you seen? Have you had a lot of people ask very similar questions? What is the one misception people have uh, 
around around the world of the working adventurer? Um, I think probably the two misconceptions are that I must be really rich somehow and that only rich people can have adventures. And the second is that I must have loads and loads of time and only people with loads and loads of time can have adventures. And I think what I've, uh, with the micro adventures I've been doing and Bo with his backyard adventuring are the, exactly setting out to try and point out that we can all do something wherever we happen to be with whatever resources we happen to have and that doing a little bit of adventure is always better than doing none at all yeah exactly Bo, do you kind of feel feel the same way are there any misconceptions that you have uh, that, that people have that you think people have around uh, around the lifestyle of a working adventure yeah i i um I, i'm going to ask alistair a question in a moment but uh i was i was lucky enough to meet um tommy caldwell and Kevin Jorgensen, when they came out here and toured the Dawn Wall, and I, I was hosting them at an event, and I asked Tommy, I said, Tommy, do you realize just how lucky you are and actually your job isn't risky um, and it mightn't have as much of a point as being a single mother? And I said this in front of 500 people, and that you, you could almost, well, there was, a, there was a, a few seconds of pause, and he answered it beautifully, of course. Um, but I often, I often question uh, just how useless in some respects adventure is in that it doesn't have a tangible thing at the end of it often like a loaf of bread or a dug hole or a pasture or a changed baby. It, it, it often is very self-fulfilling about the existential self. However, like Alistair, and I've read a lot of his back catalogue, and and I, it's funny how you think you know people when you read their book. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think Alistair and I think of the same thing. We we know of its inherent value uh, in to be human, to go out and explore places. Kids do it, uh, and then we beat it out of kids because they have to go get a real job. Um, and yet it has that inherent value of learning how to do stuff, where to go what not to do, how to do it better next time. Um, we are naturally curious. And, you know, when, when humans started to walk from one place to the other all that time ago, they did it for, they did it for many reasons. And a part of that reason is their willingness to adventure. Um, so I think, and that's just our term now, our modern term for it, but there was, they were living, you know, there were, there were many people that were living in very healthy communities with enough food in abundance. They didn't need to go to the next escarpment or, or jump in a boat to go and find another continent or another land, but they did. And, and, and they're, they're quite perplexing questions sometimes. Why did they do it? And I think you find some humanism in there. Uh, my question to Alistair is that um, how do you, I suppose... You, you, you're the most democratic adventurer I know, in a sense, in that you're so, you're so beautifully well-rounded with your, um, I suppose, response to the, the world of people who ask you lots of questions and, and things. Where, where does your, how do you split your time between um, your public, I'm happy to give my time away as an adventurer, or how much time do you, do you really do keep to yourself? Is there a formula you have to make it sustainable, for Alistair and for Alistair front of house? Um, I very much separate my lives completely um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so I, my adventure online life is pretty much me in this carefully curated shed that you see behind me, plus us, 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 us. Work. Uh, at this sort of adventure side of things pretty much like a day job and then I go back to my real world and my real life and it's a total and utter separation of the two um so yeah I don't I, I um although I try and live the sort of principles of living adventurously that I do in my working life I very much try and carry on in my private life I keep the two separate so I've personal life and separate private well, personal life and work life are very very separate beasts and i'm very conscious that i could spend all day on the internet answering people's questions but which is kind of useful but i think more useful is that i carve out time to go off 
do the things that I try and do and tell the stories with the hopefully the useful messages in those. So you have, I have to try and restrict how much time I just spend answering people's questions. And hence, with this book, just try to turn those questions into a book so that hopefully I don't have to answer them again. Yeah. And also, before you before you start, Nick, I I took uh, Bo's book. I had so I took so many notes out of it. It's fantastic. It's very quotable. And what you were just saying just before you asked me the question fits perfectly with one of your quotes about the sort of meaninglessness of adventure, but how we can try and use adventure to create some meaning. And you say in your book, backyard adventuring is about concocting meaningful events and experiments that challenge me that redefine my childhood sense of the hero's journey, that forced me to look intimately in everyday places and question how I live among others. And I think that's a brilliant summary of adventure plus purpose. Really good. Yeah, thank you, mate. I, um, yeah, and that's that's all it is. Uh, you, you get to a stage where I'm 41 years old now, and if I continue on as this sort of curious dude who does semi-illegal things quite often, uh, I'm, ju I'm just going to, end up being uh the the local weird bloke you know so you have to justify it in a in a in a more articulate way so i'm glad i'm glad that came across as articulate <laughs> yeah, it definitely it was and it was an absolute joy to to hear it all, to hear the page especially when you, when you combine it with all the stuff that you do um We'll move on to the, the last part of the show. Uh, we're coming to the coming to the end of the show. Um, and it's now time to take some questions uh, from the audience. If you have any questions of the way that you want to ask Alistair or Bo, please drop them in the comments. Uh, we'll be sure to uh, include them uh, and try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, the first question is for you, Bo, and it came from Brent Williams, who asked, as a guy that is into your 30s, how do you find time for your own hobbies with a baby slash work? Uh, yeah, well, so Alistair touched on that a moment ago, the whole time thing. Well, I, I'm no longer an academic, so I have my full-time job now is being Bo, <laughs> so it's quite good. Uh, and I just, myself and my wife, we, we're ships in the night probably too much where we, one of us is, is parent and then one of us is working and then we switch. Um, but we have lots of help now and she's at the age now where she can go off and, and be a, a tot elsewhere. But it's, it's very much a... Um, I don't have time to be that adventurer that I was when I was 20. So that's why I'm now pushing myself into this sense of perception thing and backyard adventuring suits all of those things. It's wonderful when, when I can go less far, uh, for cheaper and be home for dinner and I, I come home and I'm enthralled and, and something really new has happened and I'm sweaty as all heck and I'm sore and whatever and so that's the whole shtick with back out adventuring is to squeeze the life out of it yeah absolutely great response um we've had a, another question from georgina ma which is directed to both of you but i'll throw it to alistair uh, first for this one do you think that having a background in the bigger adventures slash challenges has changed your approach to thinking about risk for micro or more local adventures as a person coming from a non adventuring background, I find that the biggest barrier for me is overcoming the risk, the risk aversion. Um, yes, without question of a doubt. It, it surprises me how often uh, I hear questions like this. And it, the reason it surprised me is because a lot of these things don't cross my mind. Having done some stupid things in some stupid corners of the world and squeaked through more than I should have done. I now find just exploring local to in England extremely relaxing and comfortable and easy. And I have to remind myself that that's not the case for everyone. And so in my writing, so particularly in my micro adventures book, I try to essentially say, if you find this too daunting, do this. If this is still too daunting, do this. Go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Even if that becomes just go for a walk around your park or whatever it is for you, just do the tiny little thing that gets you in motion. Hopefully you have a good experience, realize, ah, oh, that was okay. I did better than I thought. And then you can step it up a little by little. But by all means, I don't think you should feel that you're alone in being risk averse. It's hammered into us by society these days and I think we should try to be a bit more 
excited about the opportunities and appreciative of the physical benefits to our physical health so we don't die, uh, our mental health, which is crucial these days. These are the good sides of taking small little manageable perceived risks in the outdoors. So start with whatever tiny thing feels comfortable to you. Go for it, embrace that, enjoy it, be proud of it and do a little bit tougher next week if you want to or don't just stay little but just keep doing something fantastic advice i'm going to be taking that advice <laughs> when i when i go out uh, this weekend um question for, for you both from nathan alterator bo will you ever return to your big macho adventures overseas or will you stick to your current micro adventures my six-year-old would also like to ask why do you like going out in the bush so much well, I, I could give you a really, I'll start with the second question first. Uh, I love going into the bush so much uh, for many reasons, for, but for most of which I'm not sure. Uh, they're quite, they're quite part of our uh, DNA. They're, they're imprinted in us. Uh, there's lots of theories floating around about it called uh, biophilia and ecophilia that green spaces make us feel fantastic. They restore our attention and they make uh, the world's problems seem less and, in fact, our own personal problems seem less. And so you come back feeling refreshed, even though you've walked 10 Ks or gone around the block or whatever it may be. So I love it because of that. It just makes you feel better. It, it really does. You see a big tree and it, the tree is bigger than you, so your problems seem smaller. But in terms of um, the first part of the question was, uh, will I go back to Grand Adventures? As a shout out to one of Alistair's books. Uh, really good compliment with each other, those two, the Grand and the Micro, and they talk to each other. And yes, we have had the great privilege to go off and do Grand Adventures um, to, in a sense, uh, give us the bedrock of uh, competencies, constitution, and want an ambition there to, to kind of recreate that in some way, shape or form. And that's why we go searching for it in a micro grid or in our backyards. Uh, yes, I will definitely go back to grand adventures and they will be spliced into my backyard adventuring. Um, they will, they will take different turns and they will be different. Um, you, you know, I'm very aware of my carbon footprint now and, and how many laps around the world I've done. And it's a mighty lot. So, uh, when, when, when I do these things, they will be pretty um, purposeful and, and very much thinking about um, if I could do this elsewhere. But yeah, Grand Adventures, they'll be, I'll, I'll hit them up again for sure. Yeah. Can I just add a small thing to the end of, uh, of that comment there about the, the biophilia, just how being in nature makes us feel good and also um, what constitutes a difficult challenge. So something I've started doing on my single map is... Um, I set up my camera to do an hour's time lapse of clouds or trees or whatever. And then my challenge is just to sit there in front of that tree and not move for an hour and just sit there with no distractions. And geez, I would rather run up and down that mountain 50 times with a huge backpack on than have to just sit in my own company for an hour. So you can have a ferocious challenge just sitting in front of a tree and enjoying nature. So I highly recommend trying to do that. Sit still for an hour under a tree. Yeah, it's, it's just a chance to meditate, or relax, or just be with nature. Um, I love it. Um, we've got a question from Chav Jehu Morosky. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and this question is for Alistair. Um, which book of yours would you recommend as a good starting point in terms of your books? Well, I've I've written books of quite different genres, really. So I've written some big travel narrative about adventures. So I've written about cycling around the world or walking across India or walking through Spain. If you want a travel narrative, uh, if you've got kids, I've written about cycling around the world or my adventure heroes for children. Um, if you're interested in the sort of backyard adventures, then my best thing would be micro adventures, which is a kind of guidebook to helping you get into small little adventures. So I'd probably say either my, uh, I'll go with micro adventures. It's 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 the in English version of Bo's book. Yeah, absolutely. It's a highly recommended. Um, we only have time for one question. One more question each from our audience. Um, uh, the first one will be for you, Bo, which is from Tom Brew, uh, which is, what's your favourite part of filmmaking? Is it the doing, the thinking, or the editing? Great question. 
Uh, today w was a failed shoot. So here I am in a little boat uh, on the river that's not the river it's supposed to be, and I'm not dressed in proper 1770 stuff, uh, and the wind was a bit ho more than we thought, and <laughs> everything was going to pot. And somehow the shots came out. We reviewed the shots in the back of my ute. Uh, you know, I'm standing there in my in my white old cricket shorts um, with mud up to my knees, and it just worked. And you get these little moments where a shot or a little sequence of footage, and I, what is called a mini story. So any film is a sequence of mini stories. Some are more impactful than others, but they're all just little pockets of story all the way through. And when you see one come together, it's just great <laughs> and you just there's several shots in there maybe it's a song point or maybe you say something in a particular way or someone else does that you really like uh and it's a layering thing so whether it's three or four or eight or 20 layers and it comes together and you see it you think boom it's very satisfying very satisfying but i suppose that is that is the that's why you keep doing it because often it takes days to come for that to come together and it's just this process of oh that shot is hopeless or that sound is crap or bow's looking the wrong way or oh what a that's not a story man that's boring whatever so to get to the point sometimes is like pulling teeth but uh when it comes it's very pleasurable um and probably for our last question from the audience and i've been noticing this one has kind of had a, a couple of responses uh, from other people in the in the uh in our in our comments on on Facebook, um, but I'll throw this one to you, Alistair. But uh, you could also chime in on this one if you like. Nicole Claire asked the question: Have you tried finding local groups to go with? There are many, such as many local meetup groups or Facebook groups out there, which shares the risk of going on micro adventures. Yes, yeah, great. There's a bunch on Facebook. There's a bunch of uh, certainly in the UK. There's about forty different micro adventure groups for different parts of the UK there's and then meet the website meetup is really good for uh finding people to go with also in the UK there's adventure queens which is a really big group of uh, adventurous women going off and doing cool stuff and another one called explorers connect who try and connect people together so it's brilliant that there are these sort of things personally I don't do it because I'm a uh, inherently grumpy antisocial guy who really quite likes to go up a hill on my own uh film myself talk it to my camera and then come home and make a film about it so i'm entirely happy going off doing adventures either by myself or with one of my three friends in life but i think it's brilliant for people who either enjoy it or would take comfort from doing it in groups so i'm all if any if there are any more that i've missed out uh, tell me on social media and i'll amplify those if i can Bo, do you have any uh, any groups that you engage with or are you uh, similarly lone wolf no, I, I'm no longer a well. I just I'm just not as connected as Al with the broader community. Uh, he's as I said before, he's far more democratic. You've only got to look at his Insta post to realise just how community minded he is with other like minded people or, or groups or or writers. Even though he he heads off and does this stuff himself, he comes back and he's part of the fold. Um, I kind of am, but I don't know of any groups. I don't um, at least not off the off the cuff of my my hand. I, I do know that things like land care groups um it's not very adventurous, but the beauty of something like a land care group in australia is that you can go wander around other people's paddocks and plant trees and that's a that's a nice start so yeah i'll give land care a, a plug i think they're they're beaut but otherwise i don't really know the, of the community um, i'm aware that we are we are running out of time so thank you to our audience for such, such fantastic questions and the kind of final point that I'll lead on which uh, one of our audience members uh, has already touched on and I'll throw to you first Alistair for this one is um, what other things are happening for you down the pipeline? Are you going to any more adventures? Are there other What's next for you? Um, well I was a bit sad that you said this call is about to end because that means I've then got to get on with writing my next book. Uh, I'm writing a kids, <laughs> a kids book about, um, I rode across the Atlantic a few years ago, but I'm writing this book for children with a girl as the star. So it's the girl who rode the ocean. So I'm bogged down, not bogged down. I'm enjoying uh, working away on that book at the moment. And in terms of adventures, I really don't know until COVID goes away. I don't know what is appropriate or suitable. So it's just climbing local trees until until and writing books for now. And we'll keep an eye out for that for that book when it comes out. Bo, 
Uh, what's up for you next? Uh, is another book potentially in the pipeline? Uh, where, what's uh, what's up next for you? Yeah, definitely another book. Um, I mean, it's very conceptual and high level at the moment. Um, I mean, we've got with myself and the Booktopia Brio team have tossed around some ideas, but um, look, I've just got to get busy continuing to make films because, in many respects, then my my books write themselves. <laughs> so I've just got to. I've got just got to keep making all of these ideas I have, and there's going to be four to six films, yeah, four minimum, six, maybe even seven films come out by the end of the year. So we've got a backlog of stuff we want to smash YouTube with, and and that's the start. That's the that's the fire I'll need for the next book, which will be written. I'll start to write that next year. Yeah, fantastic. We'll definitely be keeping an eye out for that. Oh, no, I could honestly chat to you both all day, um, but I am aware that we are now running. Time. So thank you both for coming on. It has been uh, an absolute pleasure chatting with you both. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Thanks, Nick. And for all of our listeners, Ask an Adventurer and the Art Adventurer are both published in Australia by Brio Books. And you can get your copy right now from booktopia.com.au.